Kathy Lewis, Elliot Lewis, two of the most distinguished names in radio, appearing each week in their own theater, starring in a repertory of transcribed stories of their own and your choosing. Radio's foremost players in radio's foremost plays. Ladies and gentlemen, Elliot Lewis. Good evening. May I present my wife, Kathy? Good evening. This is a wonderful time of the year. It's the time for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All of which is our due because we're an independent nation. But that independence was hard won. And at this time of the year, we think it a good idea to remember how it all happened. And so we asked Richard Chandley to retell a part of it for us, and that's what we've planned for tonight. Here it is. The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. It had been warm that winter. No ice formed on the Charles River, which was strange for Boston. Cannon guarded the land entrance to the city. General Gage, our benevolent military governor, had thought the countryside might try to cross the river muskets at the ready if there'd been ice. Therefore, no freeze, and our city remained cut off. No trouble from the rabble or city hotheads who thought it tyranny to pay a king's tax on tea or anything else without having a say about it. No rabble, no. Pay and be still. We'll put troops in your city, blockade your port, and starve you until you pay. Well, a fight against injustice can be organized if you've got thinkers and doers. It was spring now, a new year, and the sap was stirring. King's own 4th Regiment men. Nothing new about them among us. Except their actions, Doctor. All the troops are stirring, and why drill so late into the evening? Getting the winter's kinks from their legs. In April? They're up to more than that. Come, we'd best get down to the meeting. Marines moved into North Square. Their Major Pitcairn has billeted only two houses from mine. He could be there to watch you. There's no evidence yet. I'd know if he was. They quartered a sergeant from the 64th with us. He doesn't seem smart enough to spy. We're all watched, Paul. Hancock, Adams, Warren, you and I. I trust you and Mrs. Revere mind your tongue. I take no chances I don't have to, Doctor. You may be sure. There's the tavern. Should we go in together? Street's empty. I see no reason not to. <laughs> Paul? Dr. Church? Hello, Joseph. Gentlemen? You're sure you weren't followed here? Of course they weren't, Sam. They're not stupid. I don't need anyone to put words into my mouth, John. That's not what I meant. Words in your mouth? Mr. Adams, I mean... Gentlemen, we're wasting time. The shorter we can make this, the better. Naturally. But what about Knox? Where's Henry? I suggest we start and get to the meat of it. Paul, about this activity among the troops... As we suspect, two more regiments were landed yesterday, making 14 regiments of infantry, plus the artillery on the common. All are being drilled hard. Then Gage plans a major move against us, you're sure? As sure as I breathe. It points to only one thing, a move in full force outside the city to seize one of our stores of powder and ammunition. Aye. But which one of the stores? Concord or Salem or Marblehead? Or all three. He's brought in enough troops for it. That's why Knox should be here. He's our ear in Gage's headquarters. At any rate, gentlemen, we agree the time is near. Now, undoubtedly, Gage will choose the same time to move against the leaders here in Boston. Most certainly, Mr. Adams and Mr. Hancock. <laughs> the infamous pair. Then I take it this is a farewell meeting. Exactly. Sam and I will leave for my cousin's place at Lexington tomorrow. All the important papers will go with us. But should it be done now? Why wait for the city to be closed against us? We're just tempting him. Ah, there's Knox, I hope. Gentlemen. Henry, what delayed you? Sorry. Couldn't be helped. Catch my breath. Sit down, Henry. Uh, What is it? Gage. I've just learned. He knows. No, knows what, man? What are you trying to say? All about us. 
the Provincial Congress, everything we've said and done for the last six months. How? Spy or traitor. My informant in Gage's headquarters saw the documents. Impossible. He quoted for me. Provincial Congress minutes, Sons of Liberty meetings. All our names, how we function, they were right. Who is he? Which one? I don't know. They were just the documents. Must have been some hint. None. None at all. No, of course not. Only Gage would know his name. What can we do? We've got to change everything. No, it's too late for that. Our only change will be that John and I will leave for Lexington tonight. Henry, if they have this information, how will the British use it? So far, only Gage knows. His headquarters is ready and waiting. The officers will receive their orders only at the last moment. That's all you can tell us? I give my soul to make it more. I'm sorry. Then there's nothing to do but keep on as we have. You will still write express for us, Paul? Your house is still headquarters, isn't it, Joseph? Of course. Do I say it for all? If a traitor frightens us, so would liberty. Aye, just so, Paul. But it's a deuced naked feeling, knowing there's a king's man among us. Then back to our separate jobs, gentlemen. Good luck, and may God be with us. Pitcairn. Rather late to be treading the town, isn't it? Your work keeps you up, I suppose. All hours, Major. To feed my family and the British mouth quartered with us, I must work at my trade all hours. My duty to the king. Admirable. A dutiful man. Perhaps you'd care to be of more aid to your king. I have a sword clasp that needs mending. Can you do it next week? Why not tomorrow? Or will you be needing it? (laughs) A soldier always needs his sword. It's a pity. I like you, Revere. Everything except your business. Thank you, Major. Those are my exact sentiments for you. Good night. My best regards to your wife. Thank you. I'm ready for your sword at any time. (laughs) It's a pity. Good night. Yes, Rachel. The children are asleep. Hours ago. I've kept some broth for you. I have no hunger. Our sergeant in his bed, too? Just before you came. He sat cleaning and polishing all evening. Paul, what worries you? Nothing, Rachel. Nothing more than usual. I know you. What happened at the meeting? Nothing. How could it be? A traitor. Knox learned it tonight, too late to search him out. And just when you need your mind clear, when you've always trusted the man next to you, now there's doubt. There's no way of finding him? Stop everything and go through 30 men. Shh. Upstairs. Sergeant. It's not for myself, Rachel. Where and when the British move this time, it can mean war. You're still to ride express? When they call me. And if shots are fired, Gage may retaliate against families. You've got to shake it from your mind, Paul. Trust us to take care of ourselves. You trust in me, don't you? With all my heart, but... Say no more. Whatever happens, Rachel, know that I love you. Whatever happens, Paul, know there's long life ahead of us in a free country. Now, will you take some broth? The steadiness of Rachel was assuring, but still my sleep was bad that night. I'd said it bravely at the meeting, if a traitor frightens us. Yet my mind was filled with it. Each of thirty faces passed before my eyes and did me no good. The next day, a thing of importance took place in Boston Harbor. Joseph Warren and I stood on Gray's Wharf and watched. See them, Paul? Boats of almost every transport taken up for caulking and repairs. Aye, Joseph. Enough for 800 men. And over there, the man of war Somerset neatly warped into the mouth of the Charles. Oh, see how our guns lie, covering that short stretch of water over to Charlestown? What do we draw from it? One plan, anyway. Load troops at the foot of the common, ferry to Charlestown, and quick march to the nearest powder. At Concord. Charlestown's the shortest way to Concord. And the shortest to Lexington, too. Of course, that's it. Our king's man wastes no time. Grab Adams and Hancock at Lexington, then to Concord. When they finish work on the boats, that's when they'll move. And at night. Who can lend us a horse in Charlestown? John Larkin. 
But the Somerset, Paul. She'll be watching for just such a move. She'd give you a broadside. Can you safely get a message to Larkin? Of course. Then do it. And add this. Each night, have him watch North Church steeple. All Charlestown can see it. Immediately, the troops take to the boats, he'll be signaled. If the Somerset stops me, he's to ride. Wait. What if the boats are only bluff and they march out the neck? Two signals. One lantern if they go by land. Two if they cross the river. A boat for you. Have you got one? Aye, and well hidden. Joshua Bentley can row me. Good. And Paul, even among us, the fewer who know the signal and how you plan to go, the better. My thoughts, too, Joseph. We'd best not meet again. I'll send for you only when the troops have moved and we're certain of the direction. And pray the guards aren't sent for us before then. That's the juiced naked feel. I have it, too. We all have, except our traitor. There'd been a moment we'd caught each other's eye. There was trust between us, and yet we were both retreated inside ourselves, as if afraid of each other, and cold with a chill of suspicion. This, to me, was worse than any physical agony. I knew if anyone were true, it was Joseph. I hated myself for suspecting, yet could not help it. On Monday, word was sent of much activity among the British officers and the sergeant quartered in my house left in full marching kit. Then Tuesday, and the whole city stirred with troops, rumors, and notions. Rachel and I said little. The waiting was just as hard on her. Paul? Look through the window. Make sure who it is. Yes. Joseph Warren, stable boy. Yes, ma'am. Now, to Joseph's first. Go quickly. God keep you. Light infantry, Paul. And grenadiers marching to the foot of the common. They go by sea. The signal? I've just dispatched it. Two lanterns. It's positive they're making for Lexington, then Concord. I've had three separate reports. You must get to Adams and Hancock first. What about you? As soon as you leave, I'll slip out of Boston to Cambridge. Our new headquarters will be at the Hastings house. Mind you, slip carefully. They've sentries everywhere. Uh, one more thing. I've sent another express by land across the neck. One of you must get through. One of us will, Joseph. I pray you both do. God bless you, Paul. And good luck. I looked back once over my shoulder. Joseph still stood in the door. And then he closed it. I walked the edge of the common, neither fast nor slow. Troops were still marching toward the far end, the darkness making their red coats the color of dried blood. Then I turned away, following the black streets that would lead me to the boat. Excitement tensed my body, urging me to run, but I held myself. I looked toward North Church steeple. There were no lights showing. It would only have been for an instant, but I wondered if they'd shown at all. Then I made the last turn and was at the river. I'd chosen Joshua Bentley for his skill with oars. The boat appeared from under a wharf, gliding toward me like some great dark beetle. I climbed down into the stern and pushed off. Joshua nodded to me, then put even the muscles of his face into the rowing. It was young flood tide, and Joshua bent us into it. Then the moon began feeding itself into the sky, and I made out the blacker hulk of the Somerset in the dark before us. She was 64 guns. We'd passed to seaward of her, but bright in the moonlight and not out of range. We were low, low beneath her, passing her broadside. I could see her guns were run out, each one an ugly, wicked fascination that I couldn't take my eyes from. I was unaware that I held my breath until I let it escape me when we had passed. The next thing I was aware of was the boat scraping on the Charlestown shore. I left Joshua with the boat and went to the home of John Larkin. Mayor? Yes? I saw the signal. Oh. Is this the mount? Yeah. Oh, boy. He's the best in my state. I'll give you a leg off. Thank you. Oh, boy. Oh. British officers came through this afternoon. What? They patrols on all the roads. 
Didn't you know? No. You have a good horse here. Fast of mares. He'll take care of you. Thank you again. Come on, boy. Listening to Kathy and Elliot Lewis on stage. Tonight's play, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Before Kathy and Elliot Lewis continue with tonight's story, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that starting next week, our stars will make a slight change in time for their broadcasts. Be listening for Kathy and Elliot Lewis on stage at a later time on most of these same stations. Consult your local schedules for the exact time. Remember, next week, same Elliot, same Kathy, same CBS radio. Same stage to be on, on stage, but a later time. It was 12 miles to Lexington. I held the horse to a trot, and very soon we knew each other. He was a good animal, alert, willing, and there was trust between us. I passed through Charlestown and into the road to Cambridge. I was grateful for the moonlight now and could see a good distance in every direction. I had the countryside to myself. Then the road began to narrow and ahead was a large overhanging tree. It seemed a likely spot... And it was. Two riders bolted out of the shadows, the moonlight glancing off red-coated uniforms. I turned sharp, raced cross-country for the Mystic Road. They swung wide to cut me off. I knew this stretch of country. There were clay pits to watch for. They didn't know. But still, they forced me from the Cambridge Road. I had to go the long way now. I crossed to Medford and gave the first alarm. Before I was out of town, their bell was ringing. With luck, I could be in Lexington by midnight. Mr. Adams? We're all asleep. Get to your bed. Mr. Adams, the regulars are out. What? Well, who are you? I, I can't see you. Paul Revere. Oh, I'll come down and let you in. Come in, come in. Where's Mr. Hancock? I've awakened him. Now tell me. They started at 10 o'clock, nearly a thousand of them. A thousand? We learned there were offices on the roads, but nothing like this. Oh, goodness, gentlemen. Can't we have some light? We've got to get dressed, John. Uh, dressed? What's that? The alarm. The whole countryside's away. The troops have marched. We've got to get dressed. What? Their aim is you and Mr. Adams, then to Concord for the stores. They know we're in Lexington? Our traitors, sir. How far away are they? They should arrive sometime near dawn. And what about the roads? Can we get to Woburn? I think so, if you hurry. I'm to go on to Concord. Well, refresh yourself first. You have a good lead on them. Come on, John. Now, just a moment, Sam. I'm tired of running from Gage. It's out in the open now. We're leaders. The people are rallied, and we should be with them. This is not a time for speeches. I'm not speeching. I mean it. You can run, Sam, but when the British arrive, I intend to face them gun in hand. John, you're a politician, not a soldier. All the papers are with us. That's our responsibility. But you don't see the point. Paul, I ask I you... I am wh- not going to argue this in my nightshirt. I am getting dressed. You see it, don't you, Paul? You're a delegate to Congress, Mr. Hancock. It would seem wise to protect yourself. We are men. If there's a fight, I intend to be in it. If shots are fired, we're all in it. Our women, too. Gage wouldn't dare molest our women. I only wish I was sure of it. If you'll pardon me, I've got to get on to Concord. Hancock, stop wasting time. As I left for Concord, men were already forming on Lexington Green, a small, pitiful group to stand against a British column. But their women and children were being moved to places of safety. I tried hard not to think of Rachel locked inside Boston. On the edge of Lexington, I met William Dawes, the other express rider Joseph had sent, and we rode together. About two miles from the town, Dawes dropped behind to rouse a sleeping house. I kept on, but slowly, so he could catch up. Halt in the king's name! What? Don't move, you're a dead man. Dawes, run! Dawes, it's a patrol! There's another one! You men, after him! You won't catch him, not with those horses. All right, fellow. You're out late. Why? I'm visiting friends. I have many of them. Then why did you warn your companion? Why do you block the road? We're... 
Off the deserters. Come now, Captain. You think a thousand marching regulars are still a secret? All right. Then you are one of their riders. We've stopped you at any rate. Oh, much too late, Captain. The whole countryside is warned. From here to Concord, you're cut off. Cut, cut off? There are men looking for you. What? Where? You're behind our lines. You're the one who's caught. I don't believe you. What was that? Another warning. I should shoot you. And they'll come right down on you. I've got to report this. Get off your horse. You'll walk to your friends. He tugged my horse after him and was gone in the swallowing night. But Dawes had escaped. He was a born horseman, and I was sure he'd reach Concord. I left the road and cut across the fields back to Lexington. I saw Mr. Adams and Mr. Hancock leave for Woburn. My job now was to get back to our new headquarters in Cambridge and report they were safe. It was almost dawn. I found another horse and had just turned for the Cambridge Road when I saw the first British troops. The column stopped when they saw the men on the green, their bayonets catching the first morning light. I rode out wide and around them until I could no longer see. Everything seemed to fall into a terrible quiet. Then from behind me... It was something that could not be stopped or undone. You heard the shots yourself, Paul. Aye. They're still in my ears. And Hancock and Adams are safe? They're safe until our king's man learns where they are. They're safe even then. The country's formed behind us. Gage holds only Boston. How was it in Boston when you left? Double guards everywhere. They were pounding on my front door as I went out the back. Rachel, then they did go to our house. Paul, I know what you must feel, but we'd surely hear if they'd gone after families. How? How could you hear? The city's closed. Please, Paul, you're tired. You've been through a lot. Don't dream up tortures for yourself. Dream, I told you shots were fired. There's a war now. Gage knows who we are. We're princes of treason to him. Tell me for certain my family isn't hostage. Or your wife, Dr. Church. I can't. I've got to go see Joseph. You can't risk it, either of you. If you're caught, they'll hang you. They didn't catch me when I left. I'm going with you. All right. Maybe it's easier done with two. Go lie down, Paul. Get some rest before tonight. The wharf ahead there, Doctor. You see anyone? Looks empty, you know. No, there's nothing. There, the tide. If we see guards, move as naturally as possible. Aye. So far, it's been easier than I thought. I go north now. This street's the shortest way for me. Wait. I think we should stay together. Your house is to the south, that way. It's safer if I go along with you. One street's as safe as another. So it seems. I thought sure we'd run into guards by now. What do you mean? Yeah, down that way. You see them? Now, feel this in your side. Don't move. I pull the trigger. Dr. Church. You're... Yes, a king's man. I'm proud of it. At least General Gage will have one of you. Now walk ahead of me. No! Let go! God! God! And I too, Paul. But every moment in the city is danger to you. I can't be free with you here in Boston. They won't harm us. Words about the British are willing to trade patriot families for Tories. Please go, Paul. For our sake, we'll come to you soon. Rachel, there's so much I want to say right now. So much I feel. Write it. They won't stop the post. And my answer will assure you we're well. Go now.
dear Rachel, I have your letter before me with the news you will leave Boston in three days. Knowing you and the children will be with me soon, I feel a whole man once more. You leave confusion for more of it here in Charlestown. The air holds no fear, and therefore is filled with disagreements. Our leaders are not unanimous on any subject. But this is the weather of freedom. Each has his own ideas and is not afraid to speak. This is truly the beginning of greatness, Rachel. This is what we fight for. <laughs> 